Good afternoon. I'm Edmund Phelps. It's fallen me to have the honor of chairing this session this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> you may have felt a need for something on the causes of things this morning, and uh, we're going to try to fill that need to a degree uh, this afternoon. Um, our first speaker and the uh, main organizer of this conference is David Bynes, Professor of Economics and Fellow of Balliol College, Oxford. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. Let me say that there are many people who organized today, in particular Adam Bennett, who's been working with me in the political economy and financial markets program. Uh, and you will have seen him hovering around uh, as played a very important role. This has been part of a two-day meeting on the future of Europe. Yesterday discussed much more the longer-term economic questions. So in the morning there were projections from the OECD right out to 2150 about well-being and economic growth. In the afternoon there was a discussion of innovation. The after, at the end of the afternoon, a discussion of uh, the savings crisis, pensions, uh, public debt. Those long-term questions. And there was never once any mention of how should Europe be governed. It was a, a long-term economic story. And today is very much uh, immediate <coughs> questions of governance and governing. But economics is still central to those questions. And I'm going to try, and I, I'm going to ask the following question. What is the economic narrative in relation to Britain? Uh, already come out earlier today, the population needs a sense of what the economic story is. Here, in a very short time, I'm going to uh, say essentially five things. Uh, first, uh, to talk about the economic benefits of integration. Uh, they're so clearly major. The single market has done wonders for this country, although, as many people have said, uh, including the Chancellor at the beginning, uh, there's much more to do in services and single markets has done goods. Uh, think of the car industry. Quite a complicated question. It nearly collapsed 30, 40 years ago. Britain is now the second largest car producer in Europe. <coughs> it's got nothing to do with in or out of the monetary union, but it's got everything to do with the single market in being a place where you can do Europe for cars in Britain. But think also, more complicatedly, of, the, uh, of Boeing, no, I don't mean Boeing, I mean Airbus and British Aerospace and Rolls-Royce. Just think of how that collaboration, putting together stuff that ends up in the A380, would be much less difficult to achieve without the single market. Single market is an institution that not just short run buying baked beans that come from, uh, I nearly said, no, no, <laughs> from Italy, that, that's so much. That's not the right place, deliberately. Uh, but it's a long-term investment uh, issue. The single market has done important things for that. There are wider benefits of integration that have got, we were talking about this the other night. A very large proportion of, finan of, of research in, in British universities is now involved. It's not just financed from Europe. That's part of the question. But the real thing is collaboration across Europe in scientific endeavor. And, and, and think about the migration question. Complicated, but how extraordinarily London and this country has been transformed in that way. Uh, <coughs> the benefits. And the narrative about benefits is not getting out as well as it might. Those of us in the, this room know it very well. It's not clear it's out there in the Brexit discussions enough. But secondly, uh, it has to be said, and it, that's appeared centrally in, in this morning's discussion, that the, money, the choice to do monetary union has made the whole European project much more difficult. 
and yesterday we had a very clear historical narrative given to us about which there's conflict amongst the historians, but we were presented with the narrative which is partly true of Germany, that this was a deal. The French could have monetary union and be important in Europe as a price for allowing German reunification. Uh, that, that's, that particular sense of the narrative is very important in where we are now. Monetary union has been extraordinarily mismanaged, partly as a result of German memories of what macroeconomic history is about, hyperinflation, partly as a result of quite extraordinarily old-fashioned economic theory. So, in the presence only of the Stability and Growth Pact, the first 10 years of the Monetary Union involved Germany's cautious consolidation of its position, which was contractionary, and unlimited lending in the South without any form of discipline, either regulatory, I exaggerate slightly, but without fiscal discipline. And for 10 years, inflation in Spain and other southern <coughs> countries was roughly 2% above that in, in Germany, uh, even more. So that by the end of the first 10 years, the South of Europe, as a result of economic mismanagement, I was now extraordinarily uncompetitive. When I say mismanagement, there were many of us, including the founder of our research program here, Max Watson, working in the European Commission, talking about the need for fiscal discipline in the South and the need for regulatory discipline of the kind we would now call macroprudential. Didn't happen. We've just told uh, good to liberalise markets, and as long as the stability and growth pact is in place, it wasn't good enough. Crisis comes, this vulnerable, uncompetitive region of Europe then finds itself on the receiving end of the wrong economic policy, again inspired in the same way by misthinking. What would, this is a, a uh, contentious argument and a long one, let me summarize in three points. In order to get the adjustment of competitiveness right again, there needs to be much more inflation in Germany still than in the South. And that's and getting much more inflation uh, when there's very little inflation in Germany means deflation in the South and debt deflation and that raises debt deflation difficulties. There needs to be more inflation in Germany and it's being res has been and is resisted. Secondly, this inflation needs to be brought about by fiscal means, not by QE in Europe and exchange rate depreciation and asset price bubbles, <coughs> and all that I slightly exaggerate, and the things that come with trying to do this more inflation by monetary policy. And, and, and thirdly, there needs, I don't need to say more than one sentence, Willem said it all, a sovereign debt reconstruction mechanism. All three of these things have been forbidden <coughs> by Germany. I, I had a year ago a discussion in about these three points uh, with an eminent German economist who, who just said, if you want this conversation to continue, don't mention again a looser fiscal policy. What's more, more, we've passed a constitutional amendment to prevent it. End of discussion. Now, uh, this has imposed on Southern Europe uh, uh, the kind of adjustment which has never been done before. Britain quit the gold standard uh, for this sort of reason. The IMF never imposes this on countries. And we say this to Germany, and the response is, get on with it. And uh, the outcome has been a very damaging one for the Southern Europe. And what's more, when pressed with a very interesting exchange yesterday with P Peter Jungmann, who was at yesterday's meeting, uh, who very clearly said, these are burdens that you wish to impose on Germany that Germany could not possibly tolerate. To which I said, so you are a hegemon unwilling to accept the obligations of hegemony. And his reply was in so many words, yes. Uh, although he didn't quite say it, and I didn't ask the question quite as bluntly as that. Uh, we've heard this 
from, from a, a, a week or earlier, this German Europe or no Europe? This is a central question. Now, uh, what has that got to do with Britain? We heard earlier today uh, that, that um, the <coughs> uh, treasure, or was it? No, it was yesterday, um, which it was, the, no, earlier today, 2011, described as the UK's Treasury, its conclusion about this. We're well out of this, let them sort it out themselves. It would be terrific if it did got sorted out, better for us than they fix it. But it will involve the kind of political integration in Europe that couldn't possibly entangle us. Get on with it. Uh, now, there's a risk that this will fail, which is worrying for Britain whether in or out Brexit. The, the interesting and complex risk for Britain is related to it succeeding. And, and I and many others hope that in the end it will succeed and that Germany and others will recognise those three points that I've made. The risk of success is that uh, <coughs> by momentum the economic governance of Europe becomes dominated by the GFN of the countries who are members of the Eurozone. And that one way or another, Britain is crowded out of the management of uh, Remain conclusion to stay. But this is a very important challenge for those of us in favour of Britain remaining. Um, so two more points uh, is to add to this discussion something the first of these is about within Europe, exactly right, thank you, uh, the uh, sense that this difficult political problem in Europe needs Britain to help solve. We had in Nuffield College here a month ago a very interesting discussion about the future of the Eurozone. And I was told uh, in the lift on the way, no, stairs, no lift at Nuffield, uh, that <coughs> how glad uh, this particular senior Italian civil servant and economics professor was to come to, to Nuffield to discuss these difficulties. If he tried in his home country to discuss them, he would be accused of being a traitor to the European project. Mm -hmm. And we've heard some of that mentioned this morning. Difficult questions to which Britain uh, sympathetically can really importantly contribute. And I think we're looked to. Uh, uh, German people at this meeting said exactly the same. They do hope that we are there, even though this is a complex, within the Eurozone question, we could help. But third, finally, my fifth and last point, I go back to the question of narrative. Last year, yesterday's conference was, I said, stretching out 50 years. What do we think about the next 50 years? Uh, and the most powerful slide then was one showing that in 40 years' time, three quarters of the world's economic activity will be in Asia. Now, I, although I was born here, I happen to be Australian and work uh, uh, backwards and forwards. All of my economic colleagues in Australia will tell you so much about how important what's happening in India and Indonesia and China is in Korea. And our sense of that as an outward-looking European country is crucial to the European project. When I say our sense, who are the great <coughs> European trading nations? They are this country and Germany. And Germany's trade is managed within the European framework. And if you ask people, frankly, who deal a lot with German policymakers, they don't have the British sense of how to comport themselves in the world and in world negotiations. Uh, I think we do, and I think we're important for this project. So not just for within Europe, but for what happens in the world over the next 40 years. Us remaining and leaving Europe is important. Thanks very much. Schedule.
second speaker is Wolfgang Munchau, who needs no introduction. Um, he's a principal columnist of the Financial Times, as you all well know. <coughs> and he's going, I understand, to speak on about the European Union from a uh, German perspective, for or against, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I, in your programs, you were supposed to see, or you saw, you saw that Otmar Issing was supposed to speak here. Now I can confirm that I'm not Otmar Issing. Uh, and no, I'm not going to read his speech. Uh, he would have given. But I, do, I will speak about Germany, and I will, give, I will try to give a, a, a narrative from a German perspective, not in defense of, of what I you know, believe are the serious <coughs> number of policy mistakes that we made that are still being made. Uh, but I want to put this into a perspective that was slightly different from that of uh, which I saw from David. Now, Germany was, was and is at its heart not committed to the, to, the, to the European Monetary Union. That's, I think, a statement one can make pretty, pretty clearly. Now, that position prevailed pretty much until the late 1980s. The Schmidt administration was in favor of monetary integration. And there was a part around that you know, among Schmidt himself and his group, who actually wanted a procedure towards the euro. But the majority of the establishment, certainly the Bundesbank, which initially opposed the ESM, was not on board for that, reluctantly followed along his policy, but uh, not with enthusiasm. And nor did Kohl until the late 1980s. It was only after the war came down that he very quickly accepted monetary union. It was not a deal with Mitterrand, as people always uh, think, think it was from the script pro pro agreement. They met some day and then they had this agreement. It was Paul himself who decided it, uh, and then confronted, confronted Mitterrand later with that, with that decision, and then that smoothed the way towards the uh, 2 plus 4 agreement on German, on, German, on German unity. Now, the German establishment went along with that decision very reluctantly. Uh, and they made one cardinal error at the time, which was to insist that the monetary union uh, had to be uh, uh, ring-fenced by fiscal rules, strict fiscal rules, the one that you mentioned, especially the 3% deficit criterion. But not only that, there were accession criteria, there was a whole list of, of criteria people, people had, and they thought that it was, it was sufficient. To, um, to, to safeguard the monetary union against the kind of excesses they feared, which was a, a country running, running an irresponsible fiscal pol uh, policy and, 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 and requiring a bailout by the others. Um, now, the, the, you know, we heard this morning from, from Willem uh, uh, the suggestion for a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. Now, that would have been the time to have done this. This was uh, where we, we had no financial crisis. We had a fairly level playing field. The Italians had just restructured their banking system. Uh, it would have been the ideal moment. Uh, 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 even the banking union would have been would have been would have been possible at that time because it wouldn't have implied transfers. Uh, to do it now, this is the problem. To do it now is like buying insurance after you've had the, after you've had the accident. Uh, the German opposition to it is, if I have to say, is, is there is a there is a there is rationality to it if they oppose a, a, a deposit insurance to say that this is not an insurance at the moment, this is a transfer. Uh, now, it would have been an insurance, I mean, it would still have been a transfer in the end, you know, we say that with hindsight, but it would not necessarily have been a transfer if you had agreed this in the 1990s. So that problem, if, 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 if they had chosen an insurance protection system as opposed to a fiscal rule uh, system, that would still not have prevented the Eurozone crisis. But the crisis would have played out. We would have had the crisis, but the, the mechanism would have been there. It would have kicked in, and you know we wouldn't be speaking about it now. We would we would be speaking about about it in historic terms. But we would not now facing another hot summer with not only a, a British debate but also a Greek debate that's that's running concurrently and not going well from what I'm understanding, uh, and uh, which might lead to another. You know, high noon moment at some point where Greece will either leave the eurozone or default on some creditors in, the, in July, or where a, the creditors blink and, and, and it will be another, 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 temporary, another temporary loan in exchange for some uncertain commitments. Uh, and that act will no doubt be renewed again, be replayed again next year and in the following years as well. 
Now the problem, I want to go into this misjudgment. That, that I think this misjudgment of Germany was key the, of the German policy. Needs. And there is, there are, there are long, we, the, 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 so I, I sort of look at four reasons of why, of, of the nature of that of the misjudgment. The first is that when you impose fiscal rules on, you know, these are not fiscal rules you impose on, on bureaucrats. These are fiscal rules you impose on sovereign electorates. You know, you, you say to a, 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 an electorate in Portugal, don't vote for this government because it, 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 will, it, it, it proposes different rules. Now, electorates do not obey fiscal rules. They, they vote for, for whomever they want. And we see this in Italy now, that Renzi is now flouting the rules quite consciously. And Germany flouted the rules. A lot of it was made of that. And they did so for good reasons. They introduced structural reforms. And you know, they said, we need to flout the rules. Uh, obviously, they, they went against the, their own rules in 2003. Uh, Renzi now does the same. He is promising, and I, my, my expectation is that he will run very high deficits. Uh, well, not high, but high relative to, the, to, 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 to what he's supposed to do uh, for the remainder of his term. Uh, Spain is, is flouting passively. Spain doesn't have a government. And because it doesn't have a government, the old, the old fiscal policy basically is just stays on the pilot, so there's just overshooting uh, all, all targets. Uh, so we, we, we'll be having another sort of fiscal, fiscal discussion, which is a little bit in the background now, but you know, expect it to resurface in the next few weeks. I'm, I'm very certain this is going to, this is going to come up again. But the, the experience of the fiscal the fiscal stability pact has been rewritten in 2005, and several times since. They now want to rewrite it again. It's basically a sign that this thing hasn't worked. Uh, that they have tried to, you know, it, it always needed to be fixed, it still needs to be fixed. And the absurdity of imposing rules is just, you know, it's just, I mean, we've, I've heard now that the Commission is pondering a, 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 a fine on Spain. But in order not to make it so painful, the fine is <coughs> zero euros, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the second misjudgment was that the source of instability in the Eurozone were, were, were actually not fiscal, they were private sector banking problems, except for Greece where they were, where they were fiscal, but they were, they were private sector in terms of the flows, and they became public sector uh, uh, liabilities after banks needed to be bailed out. So that was sort of an analytical error, and you know, Germany was very much part of that, 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 that those, those private sector imbalances. Um, The third misjudgment that, 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 that they made is that the ability to adjust in a crisis, I mean, this is a mis misjudgment that I made, a mistake I made too. The idea is you go into this, you have a crisis, then you fix it. And, and, and this is something, you know, because I, I had to learn something, I had to re, you know, change my mind over something, and think, and that, that was a dangerously complacent view to take. Because, you know, this is something it, it happened maybe in the 90s and 80s, but it is not happening now. The, the idea that you go into a crisis and let say, okay, we have to move towards the next stage of integration just because we have a crisis. We've seen the response was to do the opposite. And this is also in the context of deposit insurance, which is the, the logical answer, and I agree with them that, you know, it is, you know, a, a, a fiscal union is not necessary or logically needed in a monetary union, for, for monetary union to work. But a, an insurance mechanism is needed logically. But, you know, to, but it, you know in a crisis it is impossible to to uh, implement an insurance mechanism because at that point it's a transfer. In other words, it becomes a fiscal, a fiscal, a fiscal thing. So it's the same. It, it amounts to the same to the same situation. Now, the fourth and the most probably the most important miscalculation that Germany made is the impact of its fiscal austerity policies on on inflation, uh, especially in the context of a central bank that has lots of rules applied on applied to it. That is to, you know, that is, it was not supposed to do quantitative easing, or at least people thought it was not supposed to do this. Um, it was not supposed to cut interest rates to negative levels. Um, it's a <coughs> bank that, has, it's, that tends to act late, it has a very slow reaction function. Um, and this combination of German austerities and a relatively, you know, a relatively slow central bank produced a, a, an inflation uh, undershoot. It produced, you know, I wouldn't call it deflation, I always look at core, core inflation, but core inflation has been under 2% now for eight years, uh, for eight straight years, and it's now at about 1%. And that to me is the inflation target that they have, that they have pursued. Um, um, and
kind of uh, coefficient came off target in 2008. Um, it, there is no target specifically, but it was the, the level. It has never reached two percent since since then. It fell, it fell, it's now falling to one percent, and that's now basically a, a sign of, of, of German policy. And uh, and here is where the Germans critically miscalculate because now the ECB reacted to that, and it reacted to this by not only cutting rates but by imposing Q quantitative easing. Draghi even talked about a helicopter drop in his last press conference. And now they're not close to doing one, but it is clear that, that there are, you know, there are no ways to surround, to get around the German position by a you know, you know, QE is a form of debt monetization. It's not a not, it is not a complete debt monetization, but it is a partial debt monetization. <coughs> a helicopter drop could be a complete debt monetization. You just dump money, large sums of money onto a you know, onto, onto, onto the lectures. You know, it, will, it will solve the problem, but it will, it will be the ultimate bailout, the, the policy that Germany has prevented. So what they're seeing and what they fear is now, you know, everything they're trying to keep together, all these rules and these, this fiscal discipline is now being, being circumvented through, you know, through the back door. I saw a, a, um, a, a, a German newspaper report this morning. It was a, quite typical of this. It was the headline in Die Welt that says, it's a Draghi steals identity of a German sailor. And then it's, it goes on. And I thought, when I read this headline, I thought I was reading sort of a private eye headline. Because, I mean, it, 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 you couldn't put it better like this. And then it says, he abolished interest rates. Uh, you know, statements like that you read in the German press, which are completely, you know, uh, I mean, when we talk about the British press and, and you know, and the build-up of your skepticism over the last 25 years, and how it sort of slowly crept up, uh, you know, this is now happening in Germany. This is now happening in Germany in respect of the ECB. The same kind of, you know, uh, hysterical, uh, non-factual reporting, uh, and it's going continuing and continuing and continuing. So, so let me conclude, and I have exactly zero minutes left. Uh, <laughs> um, let me just conclude um, that that I expect no resolution. I don't expect this thing to blow up in any, any spectacular way. I expect gridlock to persist because that's what the EU does when it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. You know, it, it, it's very hard to undo the EU. What Britain is doing is sort of the most extreme measure you can take to hold a referendum on membership. Uh, and obviously, if Brexit wins, then there will be other referendums and other. That would be the, <coughs> the process of disintegration. But if Britain wants to stay in, my, my expectation is that we will, we will, we will, we will, you know, we will continue, uh, but uh, and the eurozone will ultimately, it will not fall apart, but it will shrink. There will be members, members leaving, and I think, you know, that's, as, as William was saying, you know, Italy is indeed a, a dangerous, you know, a, a country where debt sustainability is becoming an issue, especially when interest rates go up. So that would be my my expectation of a of, of continued instability for a considerable time. Our next speaker is George Pagulatos. He's a professor of economics and business at Athens University. Thank you very much. I I have the uh, never the questionable uh, privilege of being uh, a Greek and a Eurozone scholar at the same time, which is a bit like uh, observing a zoo from inside the monkey's cage. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so let me, um, let me start from the, from the fundamentals. Uh, we have been faced with a crisis, and I'm taking the, the standpoint of a country like Greece inside this crisis, and faced with this crisis, we have these three fundamental options that uh, that you might see I'm able to, uh, to use this. Um. Yes. So, um, three basic options inside the Euro. The first, and I understand in the framework of, the, of talking about Greece, this is a, a tempting option exit. Um, let us not underestimate uh, the costs of that. Uh, an exit of any country from the euro would uh, do away with the revocability 
of what the currency union is about. Um, and this is not something that would stop with this problematic economy. It would create a precedent uh, that markets would <coughs> judge any other country against, and it would uh, um, create a sort of a constant vulnerability in the other peripheral countries. It would generate domino <coughs> effects that would um, threaten to materialize and uh, turn into self-fulfilling prophecies as markets will start betting who will be next. Mm -hmm. So even though this is a tempting option, and I understand yeah, its uh, um, tempting nature, uh, I would say that this is not an option we should consider. We cannot uh, go back, even though one could argue that an economy like Greece should have been admitted to the Eurozone, and this is a completely different discussion, this discussion doesn't help us confront the actual problem here. The actual problem requires the Eurozone moving ahead altogether. At least that's my view. And of course it would be disastrous for the, for the Greek economy or any other, any other economy of the vulnerable periphery uh, to experiment <coughs> with that option because it would uh, surrender to bouts of devaluations and uncontrollable inflation, uh, defaults and very severe depression uh, that would last for several years before there would be any hope for recovery. The second option is what we have largely <coughs> followed so far and that is uh, internal devaluation and national reform. So we treat the crisis in terms of a national crisis and we move on to cure the economies that have been, uh, that have ended up in that situation. Now this is, this is certainly very costly. This is uh, deflation that older uh, economists uh, used, used to talk about when saying that wages are sticky, when saying that you cannot cut nominal pensions and wages. Well, in fact, they have been cut four and five and six times in Greece. Uh, with a very heavy social political toll. Uh, it could perhaps be better targeted compared to currency devaluation. I'll be happy to explain that later on. Um, an important snag there is that um, in an environment of an average Eurozone inflation close to zero, this means that the periphery would be adjusting uh, through deflation. And this is an extremely painful adjustment even for an economy that has already completed a significant part of its internal devaluation project. Finally, we have the optimal option, and that is transformation of the union into a genuine economic and monetary union uh, through the elements that uh, we uh, see over there. Now, let me try and sorry, let me try and compare the crisis reaction policy mix that we have seen so far with uh, one that would have been preferable inside a more genuine economic union. Now, I'm not saying that this would be possible, institutionally possible, or that even the political will for that existed, but it is worth comparing. So what should have been done? We should have seen a more aggressive monetary easing by the ECB from day one. We saw instead a lot of ECB activism, uh, but interest rates is, in the beginning at least remained higher than other central banks. The monetary transmission mechanism was broken, and that was why the accommodated monetary policy from the core was never transmitted to the periphery. Uh, OLT came too late, QE too late, uh, the, the Eurozone trapped in the deflation low uh, We should have seen fiscal consolidation emphasizing on the medium term. Uh, instead, in order to temper the recessionary impact of adjustment, instead, fiscal consolidation was very heavily front-loaded, as in the case of Greece, amplifying recession, the policy mix was heavily pro-cyclical, um, operating as a self-fulfilling uh, deflation, recession that was even deteriorating further, uh, the debt, uh, deflation outlook and so forth. We should have seen more structural reforms at the national level. National structural reforms came too late and sufficiently supported by the European Union. We should have seen a counter-cyclical stimulus at the Eurozone level, uh, mainly by fiscal means. We didn't see that. Wolfgang Munchau mentioned that. Uh, almost no counter-cyclical euro area policies by way of investment uh, stimulus, by way of uh, demand stimulus in the core economy countries. Um, all policies remain restrictive at the same time, and that is why the Eurozone has grown at a lamentably lower level compared to the US or even compared to the rest of the European Union. Uh, we should have seen leaps of integration. Instead, we saw muddling through and more muddling through, buying time for national adjustment to deliver, <coughs> but always behind uh, the curve. Now, um, further on, we should have uh, seen some policy leeway being given to the peripheral economies, some breathing space. Instead, all policies for the South 
have been restrictive, have been restrictive uh, in fiscal terms, in incomes policy terms, and in monetary policy terms. So these have been policies that have been uh, operating in a self-multiplying pro-cyclical manner. And the reason I, I mentioned monetary policy terms, of course, the ECB policy was accommodated, but because the transmission mechanism was broken due to the um, uh, currency denomination risk for the periphery, this uh, monetary accommodation never reached uh, the peripherals. And uh, the costs remained very high, the credit costs remained very high for Greek companies as much as for Portuguese or Italian or Spanish companies throughout the crisis. We should have seen coordinated debt relief uh, from the beginning. The cost of it, if it had been followed in the case of Greece, from the beginning would have been far less. Um, this did not happen, uh, because of, mainly because of the implications they would have for uh, German and French banks. Uh, even the debt reprofiling for Greece was rejected back in 2010. Instead, we ended up with a much heavier mix of debt restructuring. Over 100 billion were written off, and still that was not enough further debt relief would be needed down the road. Uh, we should have seen a backstop and assured Eurozone membership, the kind of we'll do whatever it takes, uh, could have been uttered earlier on for the peripherals, instead it never was, and the Brexit risk or the currency denomination risk um, spread and cancelled any adjustment effort that was followed uh, after 2010. Uh, the crisis was, should have been treated mainly predominantly as a Eurozone systemic crisis, Instead, it was uh, seen as the sum of national crises that should have been treated uh, through national policy means, uh, resulting from a southern laxity or perhaps with some cultural features um, in the Mezzo Giorno. Um, and this provided for a very poor mix of adjustment policy. We should have been policy seeing policies that would have broken the bank sovereign contagion, the doom loop. Instead, this intensified. And instead of progress to deeper integration in genuine EU, we saw more uh, of modeling through. Now, let me, of course, say that Greece, the Greek crisis did not begin in 2010. Uh, there was an original sin involved um, in the fact that Greece failed to take advantage of, of a very high growth, uh, high, high, uh, growth period in, uh, between the mid-90s and 2007. Greece grew by about 3.5% uh, per annum. Uh, it failed to take advantage of this period in order to um, sustained primary budget surpluses. These were abandoned after 2002, reduced public debt, and implement structural reforms in good times. Because it is in good times that structural reforms have to be implemented, not at the time when the economy is sinking uh, in a vortex of depression, and there are no instruments to uh, compensate losers, and there, there are no instruments to offset the unemployment effects. Um, the uh, Greek economy was uh, operating, was few, was uh, uh, running uh, without any breaks on uh, after financial liberalization and uh, Eurozone accession happened. Uh, consumption was fueled, the imports, current account deficits rained the day, non-tradable sectors grew at the expense of tradable uh, sectors, uh, high growth was the result of overboring. This was very typical in the entire periphery as we know. The debt driven growth that you see there uh, diagrammatically um, Growth was practically led by high borrowing rates initially of the public sector and subsequently of the private sector as well. And there you can see something that was also mentioned before by Dr. Munchal, that uh, the, um, the problem of indebtedness uh, in the Eurozone periphery was something that resulted largely, that, that happened, evolved largely after accession, and it evolved through mainly uh, which the channels of private sector indebtedness. Uh, as you can see there, public debt levels remained almost the same. What increased very drastically was the private debt levels. Uh, by 2008, a number of countries uh, had entered a situation of extreme fragility. Uh, let me speed up, and uh, I, uh, uh, some elements of Greek uh, demand-led growth over there. You can see the highlights. Um, the widening of the competitiveness gap in terms of real effective exchange rate. Uh, Greece failed in a spectacularly orthodox way, though the crisis in the Eurozone was more of a current account uh, deficit crisis. It was a sudden stop. Uh, Greece failed in a very orthodox way uh, through the public sector channel, but also through the uh, current account deficit channel. You can see it down there as the outlier, and you can also see there the adjustment that has been implemented within uh, five years. Um, 
with an impossible, with nearly impossible mission of trying to follow internal devaluation and restore competitiveness to that in a way that uh, aggravated the debt deflation um, through um, <coughs> undercutting the denominator of the nominal debt. Uh, there you can see the extremely heavy fiscal measures that were implemented. Uh, you needed about 8 percentage fiscal measures in order to produce about 2 percent uh, primary budget deficit uh, improvement. And uh, of course, this was very much the result and the cause of the deepening of recession. <coughs> the overall reform responsiveness in Greece, according to international organization, has been <coughs> quite impressive. Um, the real GDP growth and unemployment has been also quite impressive in negative terms. And you can see there the outcomes of deflationary adjustment, reform reluctance, political instability, Brexit, leftist populism, and jingoism for the last uh, few quarters of 2015, where a recovery was actually cancelled as a result of uh, experimentation and enacting quite improbable <coughs> ideological fantasies. Now, the cumulative loss that you can see, uh, by the way, Greece now is, has surpassed Latvia. This was only up to 2013 and probably close to the United States. Let me uh, stress the fact that the, the recession, the crisis has left us with a very heavy legacy in terms of a sharp decline in the employment rate. Uh, you can see below 55%, close to 50%, and also a decline in the investment rate. Now, this occurs very negatively for the potential growth of Greece, which will be lamentably low, as will be, but to a lesser extent, for other Eurozone peripheral countries. And this is an excerpt from uh, Padoan's uh, contribution. Now, uh, there are 10. Uh, bullet points of what went wrong. Some of them I've already mentioned. I don't have the time to go through them. Um, but let me uh, try to Everything. conclude by, um, by mentioning that um, we should try and, apart from the national level adjustment, treat the crisis in terms of the systemic crisis by turning the EMU into more of a workable currency union. There you see the, fami the, the, the familiar features of a currency union. Basically, risk sharing uh, in the EMU can occur through three main channels, the monetary channel, the fiscal channel, the financial channel. Any one of the three would do. Um, there are uh, procedures in all three of them in terms of broader deepening of the EMU, but none of them is sufficient. Um, so this is a typical shopping list of EMU reform objectives. Many of them you can see in the five presidents report. Let me quickly uh, move to my conclusion. Um, in conclusion, what I would like to say is that for the periphery of the EU has been a force of convergence and catch up. Uh, weak economic governance systems need this externally imposed discipline that uh, the Eurozone has offered them and the EU has offered them, but they also need mechanisms to ensure reforms in good times and avert procyclicality. This was uh, a weakness of the Eurozone before the crisis. However, financial liberalization and single currency unleashed emerging market dynamics and across the further peripheralization for the peripherals, accentuating economic vulnerability. Uh, the single currency has ended up a force of fragmentation. Vulnerability was further amplified by the enduring effects of the crisis that I mentioned. Final question, and this is a really big question, what is the growth model for a demand-led economy that can no more rely on deficits and is not competitive enough to be export-led? Theoretically, the response to that is a hard path towards, and this is my final slide, rebalancing, boosting the tradable sector, raising non-wage competitiveness through productivity enhancing reforms, remaining in the single currency regime. It's easier said than done. At the same time, the EMU should be doing its job in supporting reforms at national level. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our last speaker is Professor <coughs> Hanna Gronkovich, well, uh, she is a um, professor at um, one of the universities, excuse me, I've forgotten which one, in Warsaw. Warsaw University. Warsaw <laughs> University. Uh, three Love times her. elected mayor of Warsaw and former governor of Poland's Central Bank. <clears throat> I would like, of course, to, uh, to thank for the invitation for this very interesting session.
seminar. And uh, the question which was put was, what were the original ambitions and to <coughs> what extent have these been met? What are current concerns? Of course, I will talk about Poland. So uh, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that the last 20 years have been the happiest in a millennium of Polish history, mm -hmm. characterized by peace, democracy, and rapidly rising welfare. Of course, uh, my opinion is that it can change because we have very Eurosceptic and, uh, and, uh, and uh, also democratic government, but because I am a member of the opposition party of Donald Tusk, so of course my Yes. Openly, I'm speaking that I'm not happy what was happened. However, however, I ho I still have a hope. Poland has not persis persistently outperformed its relative economic development from 1990 to 2013. Can be divided into three distinct periods. In the immediate post-communist transformation, from 1903 to 2000, its average growth rate was more than 5% a year. During the global boom from 2001 to 2007, on the contrary, Poland had lower growth than other countries in the region almost all the time. During the global <coughs> financial crisis and its aftermath, Poland outperformed once again. Why it uh, uh, has happened? Of course, we had privatization, liberalization of foreign trade, Currency convertibility, open economy, deregulation, privatization, also a good uh, system of exchange rate. But uh, if we talk about privatization, early attempts or at large scale failed, leading to a large share of the big enterprises remaining in state hands. It has not become easier to privatize over time, and state corporations have repeatedly been involved in. Uh, different problems. Poland saw so privatization was a drawback, but Poland could get away with it because of its initially large private sector comparison to the other former communist countries. And the others reformed, which are already mentioned shortly, being so radical. So uh, Poland uh, in, the late, in the 90s, in the beginning, had less foreign direct investment than, for example, Czech Republic, Hungary, or Estonia. And uh, 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 also, we had uh, excessive budget deficit in the range of 4 to 6 percent of GDP from 2001 to 2006. We had also highest public pension expenditures in the world in the mid 90s. It was 16.16 percent of GDP. Uh, so, but uh, during the global financial crisis, Poland stands out as the greatest success. It was the only EU country to grow in 2009, with a slight economic contraction only in the last quarter of 2008, while the average euro area contraction was at the time contraction over 4% in 2009. So in the, during the crisis, only Poland and Slovakia had uh, uh, low inflation and uh, quite high growth together during this Six years, seven years, it was uh, about 20% of GDP. So uh, this is uh, our success in a nutshell. But uh, I was also asked to, to say about current concerns. So uh, even the best past performance does not guarantee that Poland will continue to outperform. What are the challenges? We have relatively low investment rate, uh, still insufficient quality of higher education, low R&D spendings, and also uh, the public sector. Uh, the Polish state is relatively <coughs> expensive, spending at more than 40% of GDP, and it's not very much uh, effective. So um, this is uh, the, the, the concept. Yes, yes. Just I have a sentence from the bottom. I have a contract who is the former minister of finance. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, but talking, it was in 2013. So. Yes. 
So talking about the, 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 the concept, I would say that uh, I'm scared of protectionism and so-called reformization, because we probably have heard that, uh, that uh, the current government would like to uh, reformize, as is a direct translation, some of the uh, companies. It, it was done once, 10 years ago, with the same government, the same, option, uh, the, the same government, and it was connected, for, uh, for example, with the uh, reformization of one of the banks. Uh, Bank of Environment, Protection of Environment, and uh, this bank has now severe trouble. So is there is no, uh, uh, I, I think that also the government can discourage foreign investment, and uh, of the, we, we, we have already some observations, you know, that, that, that it, it started to happen. I hope that they will stop and they will behave well. So now I would like to add something about how people feel, because it was very interesting social diagnosis in 2015, which was uh, produced by Professor Czapiński, and generally people feel quite well, but it was in 2015. The percentage of people who considered the previous year successful, it was 84%, and it was the highest in 2015 since the beginning of the service. Uh, for example, in 2000, it was only 69%. The percentage of respondents positively assessing their whole life was also the highest in the entire history, because it was uh, uh, 81%. In 2000, it was 68%. And uh, as uh, it was assessed in terms of uh, the indicator uh, has already joined Western Europe, considering that in most countries in the region, <coughs> which entered the European Union in the same type, time or later in Poland, this indicator has remained much lower. In terms of life satisfaction, Polish residents are rated somewhere in the middle, taking into consideration the results of similar studies conducted in 28 members of the European Union. From all the EU committee nations, the greatest life satisfaction is expressed by Swedes, Danes, and by Luxembourgers, where Greeks, Bulgarians, and Portuguese are the least satisfied. Uh, and the diagnosis result indicate that the percentage of Poles who feel very happy, or relatively happy, reach 83%. What is important, because there is such opinion that uh, the discrepancies between the, le the level of, uh, uh, of life uh, uh, became larger than before, which was not the case, because the poverty rate in 2015 also decreased with the results below the minimum living wage concerning only 3% of all households. In 2005, it was 11%. It's the same if you take uh, the uh, children and the poor households, including uh, uh, children, in, including 5,000 uh, 5, in households without sufficient funds to buy food, in 2013 was 120,000. So in fact, um, uh, people generally, they, they have impression that they improve their the situation, that their situation is improved. But uh, the question was put, who, uh, who in fact uh, managed this improvement? And they said, not the government, we ourselves. Thanks to our entrepreneurship, thanks to our good behavior, 80% said thanks to myself, or to my family. So, and this is a problem for Ventisling, because everybody is happy, but not thanks to the government. So we have at least partly the explanation why the election result was uh, last uh, October, that it, everybody wanted to have a change. So, um, um, I think uh, that uh, generally the, the, the outcome of, of in Poland, okay, the outcome of Poland is good, but it doesn't mean that people are happy of the government, they, they, they wanted to, 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 as I mentioned, to have a change, and it's difficult to explain why they decided to vote for the very populistic uh, uh, government. 
I think that uh, it's uh, difficult to predict what will happen in the future. I'm not a fortune teller. It's very, very difficult to, to say. Uh, I think a lot depends on the, not only political environment, but also on the uh, economic situation. So this government has promised so many things that I'm afraid that in the third year, the economy can, uh, can be threatened, maybe not collapse, but can be threatened, especially I think that uh, the government can discourage, uh, discourage the foreign investment, which we, of course, need. Uh, I hope it won't happen so quickly. I think that, that, that people react uh, also. You know that uh, Polish people, they are, we are individuals on one hand, but on the other hand, we know how to organize ourselves. Uh, I think that, unfortunately, in the, in the, 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 the close relationships uh, of the current uh, governing party, also with part of the church, um, it won't have a, a good impact on, uh, on, on our future, but I am still optimistic. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you.
one and done for the episode. <laughs> and you know, maybe one on
Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? We are entering the grand finale of panels, and it's getting better with each session. And as you will see, <laughs> I'm not talking about um, appetizers you have given. Um, and we will, we have four colleagues to kick off this discussion. And by the way, I'm Jan Zielonka, I'm from this college and Ralph Dallendorf fellow. Um, we have somebody I have to confess who I consider the best British commentator in the media, Simon Jenkins. We have Calypso Nicolaitis, who just works next to me, and she does a lot of terrific things, but most importantly for this particular assignment, she heads and she created and heads one of the best centers for study of Greece. And then we have two persons who you will not find for various, uh, uh, sometimes mysterious reasons in your file, so I say a few more words about them. One is Christian Jopke, who is a leading German sociologist, particularly I admire his work on migration, who is one of those German internationals who was in America, in, in Italy, and now he is professor uh, uh, at Bern University. And my co-national, Jacek Rostowski, who is not only an academic, but also been six years deputy prime minister of Polish government and minister of finance, and in the context of some of the gossips which were here uh, debated hotly, uh, six years he was sitting at the table of the Eurogroup, as you know from Varoufakis, uh, uh, a confessions, rather con contested body, and 2011 uh, he was even presiding this group. So um, you can ask him questions in the Chatham House rule, uh, in the anticipation that that he will not be misquoted. Samuel Jenkins, why don't you start? You know, discussion today we we move from real politic to symbolic politics. The title of this session is about competing identities and loyalties, and, 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 and we hope to square the circle, so to speak. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, uh, a great friend of mine, Jonathan Haidt, some of you may have read um, his book, The Righteous Mind, about the psychology of politics. And he speaks about debating. Uh, and his essential point is that in the course of debates, nobody ever persuades anybody else. You try and find arguments to support your position and to use them to attack the other person's position. You never change your mind. You never change his or her mind. Uh, the object of the exercise is to fight. And uh, I don't think anything has ever illustrated that better than the Brexit debate. Everybody starts off saying they're completely impartial. They can listen to the arguments. But at the end of it, good heavens, they ended up where they began. Um, and I, I, I have no idea what the collective view of this room is. I have a suspicion. <laughs> when when uh, I embarked on this, uh, this, this, this great debate, and I may say in Britain, this has been a quite remarkable debate. Uh, I don't think I can remember anything like it. Not, not, certainly not a political general election to be like it. Um, I deliberately decided I was going to Brexit on day one, remain on day two, Brexit on day three, right the way through. I was not going to make up my mind, but I was going to pretend each day I was on one side or the other. And it's been a very, very curious psychological experience, as Jonathan Haidt says. Um, uh, Brexit days um, were thrilling, uh, cold, um, uh, slightly wild, dangerous, a bit bleak. Um, uh, looking for friends. Um, uh, this is not me, or is it me? Um, uh, remain days were warm, comfortable, re reassuring. Uh, you know, people pat me on the back and say, so glad you're on our side, you're on the side of sanity and stability and reason, uh, the, the, the status quo. 
And I sort of, by the end of the day, I'd be longing for the next day when I feel, right, let's go for it now. Yeah. Radical uh, change, uh, disruption, uh, Jupiter. Um, <laughs> and I've been going on like that for about two or three weeks now, and I'm pretty quite exhausted with it. Um, but um, but it, 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 it has been, I think, as far as I've managed to sustain it. And I won't tell you where I started, or what I therefore intend to end. Um, but um, but uh, nonetheless, um, th there is a sense in which I think you can't really disentangle each side's argument unless you actually pretend to be on that side and see its weaknesses. Um, and certainly, in the part of today I've been here um, listening, I and mean, I've heard endless, brilliant um, demolition jobs on the EU um, and on the Eurozone, which invariably end up with saying, but we should remain. Um, likewise, whenever I spend time with the, with the Brexit lot, um, they paint this completely implausible picture of Britain outside Europe uh, as being some great sort of nirvana uh, in, in which everything can be different and wonderful and free. Um, and you know they don't believe it. Uh, but, but somehow or other, um, each side has the self to reinforcing tendency, um, which is one of the reasons why I think it has been a really very good debate. Um, but it doesn't take us any further forward. The, the only argument I've come across, which is controversial and in which I am inclined to take one side, is that it doesn't make an awful lot of difference. Um, uh, I think it was my friend Dieter Helm who, who was asked this question somewhere in this university. And he said, I think in 10 years' time we'll forget how we voted. Uh, uh, and this is not everyone's view, I know. But the argument is, as I'm sure you're familiar, um, if we vote for Brexit, um, the entire British establishment, which was uh, the Remain, will spend two years absolutely frantically trying to negotiate a new relationship with Europe. Um, we'll do everything we possibly can to pretend we didn't vote for Brexit. Um, if we vote for Brexit, we'll go on misbehaving uh, in a semi-detached way that we always did before. Um, so eventually, in 10 years' time, so goes the thesis, it won't be all that much different. And anyway, political economic crises are never quite as bad as they're protected, predicted to be by people like us. So uh, the odds are stacked anyway on, on, on the side of no difference. Um, but I just throw that in for the sake of it. The one thing I, I contribute today is really that the, the, my economics professor always told me, yeah, um, um, economics is the engine room of politics, but politics is always in the driving seat. And um, almost all, I mean, the whole basis of Project FAIR, the basis on which really the EU was sold, was that economics, in a sense, was in the driving seat. And it was never going to be thus for me. Um, Europe was inherently... Uh, uh, it, at best, a common market. And the way it was sold to the British people, and this is the cause of the trouble, it was always sold to the British people as a common market. It was about trade, and it was good for them because we were a trading nation, so grow up, be for trade. Um, it is said, and I think it's said rightly, that had it been sold to the British public as a united Europe, they simply would never have bought into it. Um, not quite sure how they wouldn't because they weren't really offered, uh, offered a chance once. But they would not have bought into it, because that's not, in a sense, the British way. They simply would have said, no, thank you. Um, you know, we, we feel close to America, we feel close to the Commonwealth. We, we, we're not, in a sense, a part of uh, the, the Germany, France, Italy, and so on. I may say, nor do I believe most Germans and most French people are. Um, I think there is a sense in which um, the, the EU was a trison de clair. It was a holy Roman Empire. His next day was in the Napoleonic Empire. But there was a sense in which it was a trick. Uh, and the biggest danger, I think, to Europe now is the emergence of, 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 of countervailing political forces, which sadly have been seized by the right. But I don't think it's, it's a joke. Um, I think there's a real reaction against the theory that you can unify Europe in that old fashioned imperialist sense. It's just not on. However, that's not the debate now. The debate is really what uh, we do about it. And I think the the thing that, the thing that uh, uh, I find uh, attractive, we put it in stronger than that, about Brexit, which I may say is an inherently implausible scenario, um, is the, um, the sort of Schumacher, Schumacher, uh, small is beautiful, disruption is necessary uh, approach to this. I was at dinner recently with some Swiss bankers. I asked them what the Switzerland think. And Switzerland, um, sorry, bankers naturally are in favour of uh, any cartel. Um, and uh, and, they, uh, and they, they, they didn't want to see Britain uh, leaving. I said, well, look, you are didn't even a member. You, you left before you began. Uh, and they said, yes, it's, it's pretty hellish because we negotiate every week and you deal with your embassy telling us to get, get our immigration acts in, in order and so on. Um, and the longer they tried to persuade me that, that Britain should stay in Europe, the more they were saying themselves that Brexit was rather a good idea. 
And by the end of the dinner, it was chaos. Um, but, but it was interesting that the, the, kind of, the kind of really sharp, bright young guys uh, who were thinking, you know, we've got to shake this place up. The EU is a disaster. Um, it's the worst sort of cartel, the bankers' cartel. Um, uh, you know, the monetarism isn't even working. Um, nothing's working properly. How on earth do you change it? You only change it by traumatizing it. You do not change it by sitting around comfortably from within. Uh, and uh, they were egging me on to sort of, you know, change sides as I was then. I think that must have been a, a remain day for me. Um, but, um, but it was very significant that, that the, the kind of the edgy, hipster, um, uh, smart money was on Brexit. It was on, it was on come on now, um, it, 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 there's no way the Eurozone is going to reshape itself short of appalling trauma, which I do believe, because of, the, as, as, as David Nelson was saying, it's because of, because of Germany. Um, but at least the non-Eurozone countries can get their act together. You vote out, you, you traumatise the non-Eurozone countries, uh, Denmark will vote out, uh, th there'll have to be a new deal in which the uh, outer zone effectively forms a new group uh, in which Britain would be a major player. Um, and th that, that, was, that was for me the exciting part of it. But these are the things I think, I think matter. Whether they'll play any part in the vote, I haven't a clue. Um, uh, anybody who says they know how this vote's going to turn out doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, when the polls are completely different, depending on whether they're online or on phone, you know that no, no one has a clue. Um, it is genuinely interesting politics because uh, it is an unpredictable politics. Um, but but uh, I came away from that last conversation uh, mildly on the Brexit side, uh, but only mildly on the Brexit side. I was on the Brexit side, but it doesn't matter very much. And I have to say, it was a day on which I was pro Brexit anyway. So had I, met, had I hit the other day, it might have been different. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Christian, maybe you will now continue. We were told that um, over 10 years we will not remember who voted how, so this is all hype. Christian, is it all hype from your perspective? Uh, we will see, Jan. As I am not on the program, I have a license to be foolish. Um, <laughs> I thank you, Jan, my old colleague uh, from the EUI, for uh, inviting me. and. Uh, I must start with two uh, reservations here. First, I'm about as German as Jan is Polish. Um, who knows Jan that knows what that means. Second, I'm not an expert on the European Union. I'm not even a Euro scholar and uh, never uh, pretended to be one. Uh, Jan will remember that at uh, our joint time with the UI, which was mid-1990s to late 1990s, the really optimistic moment of uh, Europe, Europeanization, Europeanization, that was the joint call that we were all, all us faculty members supposed to respond to. I confess, I never uh, really did. Popular dissertation topics at the time, what were they? European identity and its sociological underpinnings. According to the motto, now that the Eurocrats have made Europe with the Euro as its crowning, <coughs> the Euro scholars have to help make Europeans. Only that this creature never happened. And the swan, call it the swan song of failed Europeanization, is a marvelously sarcastic uh, work by a former EUI student uh, with the title, you may know it, Euro stars and Euro cities. It uh, shows that our Euro stars, those who made it from the bar fiasco to Amsterdam, they unfortunately lost. They lost out against now as before national elites and only ceremonially moving elites. The flat by the gracht, the desired school place for the kid, is just for the Amsterdamers to get, and not for the British or the Spanish EU by a PhD. Now let me use this occasion to comment directly on a statement that I found uh, in your conference description. Is there a European identity? And is it, quote again, strong enough to melt the EU into ever closer union? The answer is no, there isn't. It was the wrong assumption to start with. If the illusion of European identity existed, it died with what Jan knows best, enlargement. This was a literally 
tragic event. There was no alternative to it. It had to be, because the European division was artificial and unjust, unjust. But it killed the idea of Europe as strong identificatory object. And not from, uh, or by accident, from exactly that moment on, no more or less and less dissertation topics on European identity and how we as social scientists could help bring it about in a kind of self-fulfilling logic. So what can I offer you? offer you? Inauthentic German, failed Europeanist. I'm here, I try. Let me go right to the question of the panel. Are there competing identities and loyalties between the assorted states here, our four, always the same, and the uh, European uh, project? My answer is, in the case of Germany, there aren't any. And at least not at the level of, call it fundamental self-identification. And not simply because, as I suggested, there isn't a European identity to come in conflict with. That would be too easy. Uh, then there would be a point to continue for any of us. No, there isn't any conflict on the opposite side, on the German side of the coin, because there is nothing what might pass as German that could come in conflict with whatever is European identity. The single most compelling answer to what German means these days has been delivered by a comedian. Yes, uh, Brits may listen. Germans recently acquired humor. <laughs> <laughs> a self-mocking, a cynical, a vulgar kind of humor. Achtung, Germans on the right, but this time we are fucking nice. <laughs> <laughs> this is a line by Jan Böhmermann, who is now under criminal investigation <laughs> for having insulted the Turkish Sultan. <laughs> we are proud of not being proud. We'll no longer murder us vandals, or we'll come for you in socks and sandals. These, these are two more lines from Böhmermann's uh, video. It's called Be Deutsch. If you have a chance, Google it after this, uh, maybe after the drinks uh, tonight. <laughs> Deutsch, and it comes in the courts of uh, Rammstein, which some of you may know the German heavy metal band of rather low taste and uh, ear grating quality. Uh, and at the end of that video, the European flag is waved by a bizarre bunch of overweight Germans in Birkenstock, Fahrradhelm. And they exclaim, Not you. We. Followed by mildly satanic laughter. <laughs> I myself have written more dryly about uh, the paradox of universalism, which is the impossibility of liberal states to invoke particular, particularistic identities and to impose them on newcomers as a price for admission. Maybe even to invoke any identity at all, because an identity cannot be, cannot but be a particular. Uh, and, well, the 3.0 million viewers of the Be Deutsch uh, video post posted actually just a month ago, which is amazing, that 3.5 million viewers just in four weeks, they know better. Proud of not being proud is we, <laughs> not you. But let's get serious. Earlier this week, um, I was in Berlin because I am a member of the uh, so-called Expert Council on integration and migration, the Sachverständigenrat, and the reason for the uh, convening was the, the presentation of our new annual report, uh, which, like all annual reports of the Sachverständigenrat, are devoted to a specific, specific theme. This year it was, uh, as the year started with Charlie Hebdo, religion and Islam integration. And like every of these annual reports of the Sachverständigenrat, this one also contains a so-called <coughs> Integrationsbarometer. Uh, that is a re representative survey of how the general public thinks and feels about burning issues, all of, all of them, of course, related to migration and integration. And there are two tables in it. And I just want to spend the last five minutes or so on these two tables, because they give an excellent measure 
of the current German Befindlichkeit. The first table is about this Islam political Gretchenfrage. Does Islam belong to Germany? The second table, which is really technically speaking a compilation of several other tables, is about the criteria that define legitimate membership in German society. Let's begin with table number one. Here the majority of Germans, about 53%, answer to the question whether Islam belongs to Germany with a flag. No. Mm. Two ways to make sense of it. First, and that is a dominant response among learned people uh, in Germany, well, they are just a bunch of Islamophobes. The European champions of Islamophobia, as Kai Hafez says it in an otherwise quite readable book. The second interpretation, the verboten, uh, or the verboten uh, kind of uh, uh, interpretation of this response is to say, the Germans just got it right. And just think of it. Is Christianity a part of Morocco? Just because there were Europeans there at one point, and some may continue to live there? Or should we say that Buddhism belongs to Germany? Is a part of Germany just because there are a few Buddhists around, mostly Spätevis? Of course not. Europe is the Christian continent. And luckily so, because that gave us the chance to get rid of that damn thing, religion. <laughs> Christianity is the religion to exit from all religions, as Marcel Boucher has said it very, very wisely. Jack Goody, the British anthropologist, he tried to tell us that Islam is Europe just because we have coffee, croissants, pizza, irrigation, and more cerebral things. Well, excuse me, this is rubbish. It's a politically correct self-deception. But if you state such obvious things, that Islam isn't and has never been part of what defines us as German or European, this is controversial. Indeed, <laughs> it's just not part of being fucking nice. <laughs> but how should we adjudicate which of the two interpretations of the no answer to the Islam question is correct? The Islamophobic or the reasonable one? And for this I refer to the second uh, interesting table of the new Integrationsbarometer. It is about the criteria that define legitimate Germanness or membership in German society today. And the following five possibilities were offered to the interviewees. First, to have German Angusters. Second, to be born in Germany. Third, to be Christian. Fourth, to hold a German passport. The wording here was Staatsangehörigkeit, which is a technical term, not really meaning citizenship, but formal membership in the state. And fifth, to have a job. Now, if you believe American academics and the majority of uh, other academics, or at least uh, a big bunch of them, the, what the majority of Germans should have answered is that descent is the, what makes you German because that's simply part of that old uh, coil of ethnic uh, nationhood in that country. Unfortunately, only 20% of the representative sample answered this way. This was the absolute minority answer. The overwhelming majority, 90%, found that having a job makes you uh, belong to society. Dazu gehören, uh, in, in the original uh, The second most favored answer to the belonging question was to hold a German passport. 65% found this very important or rather important. And everybody knows that Germany in 2000 reformed its uh, Staatsbürgerschaftsrecht. That means now everybody born in Germany has qua use soli, conditional use soli, access to German citizenship, and also naturalization is no big thing anymore. Only 27% think the Christian faith makes you belong to German society. And fewer still, that was the bottom of it, 25 uh, not quite the bottom. The second uh, uh, least uh, favorite answer was to say to be born in Germany is what makes you uh, belong uh, to it. And the bottom was really the, 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 the second question. Now, 
This second table suggests the dominant view of Germans about their society is that of a, I would call it, multikulturelle Leistungsgesellschaft. Now this is my term, but I think it adequately captures the message. To be German today is not a matter of uh, being, it is a matter of doing. Now if you take both tables together, the one on Islam and the one on belonging, it is crystal clear. Not to consider Islam as a part of Germany is not Islamophobic, but just reasonable. It goes perfectly together with a non-ethnic, even a multicultural identity, despite Miss Merkel's contrary statement, which you may remember, that multiculti is Finnish. Achtung, Germans on the rise, and this time we are really nice. Now, what does this say about Europe and the German attitude towards Europe? To be European is indispensable part of being really nice. It is as German today as Dosenfunk, Birkenstock, Weizenbier, Farfell. Conversely, Miss Merkel today is the indispensable European, that was the title page of the, uh, of the Economist quite recently, that also, if you bother to go towards the middle of the issue, concerned a rather smallish, nasty piece about the dispensable French. From the start, Europe was the insurance policy for Germans to be safe of themselves. This insurance policy is as effective as it has ever been. For us to be proud of not being proud, we need Europe. Die Menschheit stellt sich immer nur Fragen oder Aufgaben, die sie lösen kann. Humanity only solves or poses itself questions which can only resolve. This was Marx. And of course, he was uh, only um, modifying Hölderlin in this respect. The proof of this point is Miss Merkel. Who is she? She's an otherwise uncharismatic, very methodical persona. She's more the chemist, and she's by training, than a very politician, a heroic politician, matching Gesinnungsethik and verantwortungsethik. On her, more methodical, in a way anti-political habitus hinges Europe's destiny, at least in this very critical moment. This is no coincidence. She is, in all respects, good and bad, the true child of her society. The one society that, in my optimistic view guarantees that Europe will continue to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We learned something new about the German uh, identity. And now we ask Jacek uh, uh, to, Ostowski to give his perspective. We, as you could see, we also mix disciplines and not only nationality. And you called me to make a disclosure. Yes, indeed, I'm a Polish national, Dutch citizen, Italian resident, and British taxpayer, <laughs> which, uh, uh, which suggests that there is no cock up in this session. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you very much um, for asking me to step in for. Ryszard Legutko, who wasn't able to come, um, from the governing Law and Justice Party. Uh, I think you would have had a thrill if you had come. I shall not be able to provide uh, emotions about that magnitude. Um, one other correction I have to start off with. I, I was never a, a member of the Euro group, because Poland isn't in the Euro. I was, uh, together with Anders Borg, who's sitting here, a Swedish finance minister at the time, uh, a member of the ECOFIN. And indeed, to such an extent that when uh, Poland had the presidency and we uh, were invited by 
Dr. Juncker and by Wolfgang Schäuble to join the Eurogroup as the presidency of the ECOFIN. Uh, we, we came to one meeting and then we were told that the French, uh, that Sarkozy said that he could walk out, the French delegate minister could walk out if we were ever there again. Uh, and I think the, the interesting thing about the reason I'm telling you this is it shows how the mighty have fallen. And I, here speaking about France, and I say that without any satisfaction. I think that is actually one of the great problems that we have in Europe, is the degradation of France um, and its political strength. Uh, and I'll come back to that because I'm mostly going to be talking about Germany, uh, which I know a great deal less about than the previous speaker. But I thought I wanted to just say two things um, before I started. I entirely disagree with Simon Jenkins that we shan't remember how we voted. We may, in 10 years' time, lie about how we voted. But I think that this will be one of those moments that we shall never, ever forget, particularly if there's a Brexit. This will be a little bit like uh, what we were doing when Kennedy was shot, which I think I said. Uh, and the reason for that is what, um, what uh, Mr. Krabota said. Europe is now at a, an exceptionally path-dependent moment. One major mistake like Brexit can set off an avalanche of one extremely bad event after another, which can end in a situation in which we shall be saying, not as you suggested, in, that we always overstate the consequences of crisis. We'll be saying, as people did after August 1914, we all went off singing and we came back in a slightly different mood. So I actually see this as extremely dangerous. And one of the things, as also a British citizen, for example, so I have multiple whatevers, um, is uh, I find extraordinary the unbelievable likeness of being British at the moment and of thinking of this Brexit as not being very substantial. The unbelievable lightheartedness uh, with which the British elites as well as the population sees uh, the likely event, the, the, the way they'll be able to cope in, in the outside world. My own intuition as to where this absurdly optimistic view comes from is um, extremely high London house prices. That really makes you feel good and makes you feel that the world is your oyster. Just see what happens to London house prices if you vote Brexit. Um, I, I, I mean this very seriously and I think that um, I, I don't want to carry on because uh, we'll see, but because ultimately, although the British are light-hearted, I think that the fundamental problem in Europe at the moment is, of course, Germany, as it almost always has been. And I think it's... I was extremely heartened to hear what you said, because it would be wonderful if it were true, and maybe it is true, and maybe it is true because I actually know very little about Germany. All I can say is that I observed the behavior of German governments over six years in the ECOFIN, and that behavior suggests a completely different revealed preference. And let me just say a few things about what, what I see as the, the source of the, the fundamental problem. Um, now, somebody who took part in the 1989 transition in Poland, the move from communism shock therapy. Uh, my immediate boss was called the Mengele of the Polish economy by <laughs> populists. Uh, I don't actually feel that I have any reason to justify my monetarist and structural reformist credentials. Nevertheless, uh, I'm realistic enough, and I've always believed this, that there are times, and it's about once every 80 years, that Keynes is right. <laughs> And it so happens that I, with my beliefs, extreme neoliberal beliefs, happen to have been finance minister during 
this financial crisis, which is the second time he's been right in 80 years. <laughs> Bloody bad luck. Now, the problem with this is that the Eurozone has been constructed to exclude Keynesian policies, which 80 years out of 90 is the right thing to do, but they also have bad luck. <laughs> and they've also actually had the Eurozone with those rules at this moment. And the thing that I really want to understand, because the session is about identity and national identity and loyalty, is what is the source of this in the German self-identification and in the behavior of the German um, <clears throat> The question, in a sense, is the one I asked earlier. Is Germany just unwilling to agree to the necessary changes? And Professor Vines described them exactly. Right. You need a joint fiscal policy. You need counter-cyclical fiscal policy. You, at this time, you need, and if you don't do that now, you'll never get out of a situation where you need it. You need a joint counter-cyclical monetary policy which will actually be effective by eliminating the, the re-denomination risk, as Professor Varagouda said. Right? Both of them got the, got the definition of the problem a hundred, almost a hundred percent right, although I'm not sure Professor Panagoulis is right about this. Not meaning to leave, that's a different issue. For its own good. But that's a completely different issue. I won't come back to that. Um, the question is, is Germany just unwilling to accept the changes that are fundamentally necessary for the Eurozone to survive, and therefore for Germany's national security to be secured for the next 20, 10, 20 years? Or is it unable to accept those changes? My intuition is that it's unable, because the risk is so huge. Germany has been the great beneficiary of the European Union. It's essentially allowed it to achieve the Wilhelminian program, or the Bismarckian program, of European hegemony, but without war, right? And not necessarily to the disadvantage of the rest of Europe until the Eurozone crisis started. And now we've got this crisis, and this crisis can blow all that up. And on top of that, of course, Vladimir Putin is just waiting for all this to happen. And it's not an accident that he finances the National Front, and the Scottish National Party, mm -hmm. and Alive Dead, and so on. So the question that we, can, we have to ask is, is German, are the German elites just not willing to change or are they unable to change? Because of such a deep self-identification of the German people with this frugality and the Swabian and the housewife and so on, that they simply cannot do it even though they see, and they must understand, they must understand that Germany cannot be the dominant nation in Europe without an allied but powerful France. The real problem, the real political <coughs> fault line is the fundamental humiliation of France that has happened over the last six years. And it is a total reversal of German foreign policy since the establishment of the Federal Republic. <coughs> And there's a real danger that Marine Le, Pen, uh, Marine Le Pen will win the election, because in politics, particularly presidential politics, democratic politics, when you speak the truth, that gives you huge strength. And she's the only one who says the problem, France's problem, is German. And she's right. I mean, in terms of prestige, all those political emotions that are after all, so important. Um, of course, this German policy is, brings about complete absurd, completely absurd situations. I was present at one of the Ecofins when Wolfgang Schäuble managed to secure an asymmetric treatment of, def, uh, of uh, balance of payments, uh, current account deficits, and current account surpluses. Uh, Anders was there as well. 
And the, a red light on that uh, chessboard of macroeconomic imbalances procedures was supposed to appear um, it, when the countries exceeded 3%, if I remember, of the deficit. And he managed to secure that red light with surpluses only at 6%. Well, now they've got 8% and nothing's happening either. Right? And of course, it's, it's completely and utterly economically absurd to run those kinds of deficits, those kinds of investments, though those kinds of transfers, okay, by the private sector to other countries, which sooner or later will have to nationalize them because this cannot go on forever. Right? Um, now, what are the consequences of this uh, for Europe and for the fundamental issue of integration or disintegration? I have no doubt the root cause of the present populist wave, obviously not in the United States, but in Europe, is the Eurozone crisis. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind. And the Eurozone crisis is causing the populism in Spain, it's causing it in France. It's also, and somebody said this earlier, feeding, may even lie at the root of the Brexit a referendum the decision to, run, to have the referendum, well, not to have the referendum, but to have this feeling that, why not? Because if we accept that the Eurozone has to integrate, well, then what are we doing as this sort of attached little bit and it doesn't make sense? Of course, that's a misreading of the situation because the Germans actually will never agree to proper political and deep integration in the Eurozone, at least not until they understand that the alternative is really the fragmentation of the US. They will not agree to it. They're determined to eat their cake and have it. They're determined to have integration, well, to have a fiscal, a fiscal union which actually is a fiscal disunion, a banking union which effectively is a banking disunion, because it, it, it sets the, excuse me, it sets, that's my time. I've done it, you see, for the, for the, for the, for the, for the, um, for the chairperson. Uh, because it, in, it imposes the costs in the individual country. And, it's, and it spreads around to you know, country after country. This is the fundamental source. The, the immigration crisis has just come on top. And I'll just say one final word about, um, about my own country. I'm, and the implications for Poland, I am deeply convinced that the present... Um, undermining of the, well, undermining, attack on the constitutional order in Poland, uh, effectively ripping the heart out of Polish democracy, is something that the present government has decided it can afford to do, because like Viktor Orban, it's convinced that the European Union is on the verge of collapse, and will therefore not be around to disappear. Of course, what they haven't quite gotten on to is that this is a perfect moment for them because the European Union's too weak to discipline them, but still, and European Union and NATO, strong enough to prevent the third, sixth guard division, the sixth Skov guard division from reaching the, reaching the Vistia. Um, but this is obviously an unstable and I think we are facing an absolutely existential crisis. Brexit needn't be the determining factor. You know, you can have Brexit and survive, but it'll make it a lot harder. And of course, as Simon Jenkins said, very, very correct. All true Europeans spend most of their time saying what an awful mess Europe is in. But that, I think, shows that at least they're facing the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, sure, I'm sure people will ask you whether your predictions about um, prices of houses in London is a good or bad news for, for Brexit. <laughs> But uh, I invite Calypso now to in install the array of data which will convince you
to vote according to reason rather than soul, right? <laughs> I'm not sure about reason, Jan, but indeed, um, having heard the banter on, on national identity, I can't resist reminding you of the story of the guy who's lost in a civil war, maybe somewhere in Europe. He runs into a gang, armed gang, who asks him, you know, are you with us? Are you with the others? And he said, I'm with you, of course. And he said, too bad, we are the others. <laughs> so I'm kind of the other two, like Jan and Jacek. Uh, and, you know, I guess today I'm speaking for the Greeks, perhaps, not really, because I have a Greek name and a Greek father, but on the other hand, I have a British and husband and, and kids, uh, a German grandfather, and a Polish grandfather-in-law. So I cover all the bases. The real elephant in the room is the one you've all cited. I'm born and bred in France. So I feel the humiliation. <laughs> Although I spent a lot of time at some point trying to give up my French passport when Chirac said they better have shut up these Poles and others. So, um, I guess that when we talk about all these issues, and we, as we've done all day today, uh, everyone has mentioned, obviously, the moment we're in, the crisis and Grenache. But let's remind ourselves of yesterday and the very nice decentering we had all day, situating our crisis on Grenache in the global setting, and all of the complicated factors that we're facing today. Now, of course, we Greeks, we always like to think that everything started in Greece. And for once, it was true. That's how the crisis started. And we've heard the story this morning by Yanis and George. Uh, but what is interesting, really, is that from Greece started a dynamic where we have come to ask about the competition, not just between our markets, but our democracies. Whose democracy? My electorate is bigger than yours. Yes, there was revolt to start with, and, but then ballot conflict. Who's, whose people will win out? All, and all the way to, the, to today's your refugee crisis, which pe pits peoples against people. So this transformative crisis, and Saskia Saskin spoke yesterday in a way about a kind of Schumpeterian transformative moment is full of foreboding, but also of potential. How do we reinvent this democratic competition? Now, Greece, of course, we've heard Yanis talk about the Greek agony. All the graphs are bad. But of course, the Greek irony, too, because in, in spite of all of this, Greece still supports Europe more than anyone else, almost, in, in the continent. How can that be? Now, George, and I won't try to summarize all the beautiful stuff that he said, but we're working a bit together on this, and um, I see the slides are a bit cut. Well, that's okay. Um, basically, if we want to summarize the conflict in Greece today, I think we need to overlay the bureaucratic, economic account of what's going on with the identity and the democratic underpinning of the story. So what we need to ask is to what extent can we, is it possible to have democratically sustainable reform in Greece? And we know that to, today, today, the Troika is in Athens, the crisis is continuing. And we know that if there was a virtuous trinity, it would kind of look like this, and I'm hugely simplifying George's expose. There are conditionalities. How much budget surplus, fiscal adjustment, versus structural reform. How should the Greek economy work? Troika, Europe. There is some trade-off between the two. If, if Syriza was a bit more revolutionary as it promised on number two, it might have gotten away with less fiscal adjustment on number one. But supposedly this virtuous circle is supposed to be, is supposed to be underpinned by a third dimension. A whole bunch, loads of money will come again from Europe like it did in the 80s and 90s. 81 billion we heard a few months ago to make up for the bullying of Greece. Compensatory measures, we're used to that. And for the Greeks, that's the little European flag that really represents what the EU has been all about. So if we want to understand this tension, I would submit that 
The problem in Greece is that Greeks are schizophrenic to the power three. They're divided not just as a polarized society, as all our European societies, but between themselves, inside themselves, because they want to say, no, of course, no to fiscal adjustment. That's the coercive Europe. Not only is it coerced, uh, but they hear from all the specialists that it's self-defeating. They just, it just can't go further. And more profoundly, the fiscal adjustment that they are told to have is, is distributionally blind. The outsider is not looking at the distributional impact. But of course they'll say yes if there is a lot of compensation, they're paid off. That's what Europe does. Paid off, but not just economically, morally, in all sorts of ways. And then there is the very complex, maybe, structural reform, changing our countries, blame shifting inside the country. But the real, real challenge today is ownership of change. That my European identity is about changing myself, becoming a stronger state if you're a weak state like Greece. So it's about how people feel which, because, of course, not only Syriza, every party will have to read the pulse of the electorate. Now, the question is, is it possible to get back to a virtuous trinity, or is it really going to stay an impossible trinity? And to address this question, I want to refer back. First of all, the argument is Greece can't do it alone. It's not so much about what happens in Greece. Like it's not so much only what happens in France or Portugal or in, in, Germany, in Spain that is not governed. And that's the, and I want to bring into the picture the argument that we develop with our dear friend, my dear friend Max Watson, shared his memory shared by many of us in this room and who created PEFM. As David was saying earlier, it so happens that I received this morning, uh, I guess his last publication, a chapter we wrote together in this book, The End of the Eurocrat's Dream. It's out, you can get it on Amazon. And in this book were a bunch of people, including Peter Green and Chalmers and many others, who um, share a state of mind that yes, we are Europhiles. We want Europe to survive, but we are for radically decentered and decentralized Europe. And we want to spell out how. Another kind of Europe. Fritz Sharp. Oh. And basically, it's all about riding this fine line if you have EU membership and rules and commitments between forced Europeanization and optional Europeanization. What is in between? That's the problem for Greece. Now, in order to set our chapter, we have an underlying narrative which comes from my stories, and I apologize for those of you who, who've heard me on this one, so I'm going to give it in a two-minute bullet point. We use the democratic lens understanding the EU as is, or as has been, as a democracy in the making and a democracy in danger. And that story goes back a thousand years and the oscillation between the, on the continent, between wanting to make it a land of unity and letting it be a land of anarchy. And you can spell that story in many different ways. But if we look at the history of Europe, when there was a choice between upholding the European state system and transcending it, the whole story is about the fact that we didn't cross the Rubicon, and instead we engage on the Rubicon in a process of transforming the European state system. So it's not about crossing that Rubicon, it's about a transformative logic, and that's what Europe is. And we need to stop thinking in mimetic terms when we want to resolve the problem of Europe, making EU statism replace the nation states that we have had. And of course, yes, of course it's not all about economics, it's about all of this, all of these issues, and how they connect to each other. Um, so, the question is, if you're on your Trubicum, if that's what Europe has tried to do and be since its inception, what is the driving force? Now, there's a normative driving force for Europe. And that driving force has to do with two big principles. Transnational non-domination, no Napoleons, no Bismarck, no Hitlers again ever in Europe. Hence, 
overpowering small states, including Greece, and transnational mutual recognition. We accept each other's differences. Now, the point here is, first of all, that Europe is a variety of varieties. Not just culturally that we you know, speak different language and have different novels and whatever, but that this is enormous heterogeneity is about varieties of capitalism, varieties of modernization stories, liberalisms, state society relationships, the great role of unions, memories and legacies, and different ways of belonging to Europe. There are just different, so many stories, not just differences between countries, but in debates within countries. Europe magnifies my power, Europe, Europe humiliates me, Europe's uh, questions me, and there's so many ways. So Europe, when we say unity and diversity, it's not just the social fact of diversity, it's the fact of pluralism and political pluralism, but not any old pluralism. Yes, there's always different stories, not just between countries. And of course, what I, when I theorize that, the term democracy is important. Uh, and Max um, agreed with me here, that democracy is to state that Europe um, is a really a union of states and peoples and citizens. It's a transnational reality rather than the other two alternatives, alliance of states or federal states, which are more in common with each other than they have with the democracy, because they each need one demos for one democ democracy at the national or European level. And if that's the case, then democracy is really a third way. Now, Europe has never been a really good democracy, but it's tried. It's its philosophy. It's the spirit of what it's all about. And indeed, I would have said it's all about Kantian idealism about Europe, but we could come back to that. Mm -hmm. the, the point and the summary is that we have demoi, including a kind of thin European demos, I don't mind, but we have all these demoi, or regional demoi, if they come about. We have the common kratos, but because we're in it together, but not as one. But these demoi are not any old demoi. They need to be radically open. They're, they need enlarged identities, as Kant would say. And if you ask, of course, what's fascinating, and there are, of course, hundreds of academic books, and my students in the room will have studied them with us, you have all these various spirits. It's fascinating to see that in the crisis, the, those who say that I'm European and country, or country and European, stay on top. In Greece, they're a bit higher. In Britain, they're quite lower. But those two curves uh, remain there. Uh, sorry, only country or country and European. So we have a question as to how Europe, all Europeans negotiate this double identity. But the crisis hasn't changed that. It's changed the vision of the EU's policies across states, rather than these identification questions. And indeed, the, for the crisis, what it has done to the whole story I just said, with the storms that have hit us, is to say, OK, now we, why do we feel torn? Because there's the German-led temptation let me be fucking nice, and to be fucking nice, I need to be European, and to be European, I need to unify this continent, except I want my cake and eat it too, as we just heard. And of course, the Greek fears and the Brit British demons and all the others are fragmentation. So are we going to stay on this unstable equilibrium, but beautiful equilibrium, that is the Rubicon? That's the question that has been posed by the, by the crisis. <coughs> and with Max in the chapter, we we go to a great extent in, in talking about what we've heard all day in the German Orthodox narrative, very straightforward, who's to blame, debtor, who should adjust, debtor, who should pay, who should set the rules, and we just show at every level how this is a leaky reasoning. I don't need to convince this room, and we've talked about this a lot already. To summarize the point is that what we see is a great merger, you know, it's, we know that the World Bank is not the White House, but in Europe what we have is a troika that has now become Brussels. That's the problem. It's the great merger because between the external conditionality logic and the polity, the we are in it together as a polity, is the fact that those two things have become conflated. And the whole story of the crisis could be summarized as doing away with this conflation 
That's legacy cost. We may have needed to do this in the short run, but to recover the spirit of democracy, we need to do away with the great merger. I will skip on how specifically you do it, but what we need to do is basically address the pathology that existed in the EU but, but have been magnified by the crisis. So it's not, it wasn't hunky-dory and beautiful. And those pathologies were spoken on this very table by Nikos Kotias, the Greek foreign minister, who spoke in June last year. And whether you agree or not, but that's the dominant discourse in Greece. Greece has become a dead colony. And everyone in the room was like, really? Mm, that's a strong term. As if we hadn't ourselves been involved in a seven-year program, John Darwin is here and participated in it, a big book on echoes of empire, which could be summarized as the fact, at least from the Europe part of it, that Europe is, has a post-colonial condition, which is a dual thing. It tends to reproduce its colonial DNA, the idea that you can and should govern at a distance, govern others at a distance. Yes, that's reproduction, but it also wants to transcend and overcome that in various different ways. And it's, it's negotiating that duality both in the world and inside Europe that we are up against. And that means, that means dealing with, of course, the, the biggest pathology, I think, the, the kind of messianism that Europe has been really, in a way, blessed with at the very beginning by our founding father, but which became a pathology. I know I have really very little time left. So we need to recover the right of politics. Uh, we need to um, deal with the hegemonic trope, stay nice. And we need to address and see that what's happened in Europe is a kind of deconstruction of democracy, a denial of recognition. That was the first instinct, that somehow economics sipped in to identity. And so we've had this Greek-German story for years now. And it is one that has fascinated all of us and infuriating all of us. You remember that one. You remember that contrast. That's what we started with all together. And what struck me and my colleagues and, and friends is the, how everything has been lost in translation at that moment. Amazing how it looks the same, huh? Google and, and, and lost in translation, Germans forget that when the Greeks say ohi, in 2011, then they say it again in 2015. It's not just know what you're doing. They repeat the ahi that they painted on the, with trees on the mountain for the approaching troops of German troops in 43. I talk with my German students, some, might, some may be in the room. They've never even learned about German occupation of Greece. It's all the forgetting. Of course, Greeks deal with it very badly, but we need to recover what often and I called in an article the day before the referendum in July, uh, yes, or yes with dignity. Yes with Europe, to Europe, but with dignity. And how you do this is the big question. So the, the democracy challenge is to go back to the various sources of legitimacy that we've discussed already in other um, sessions. Give up the bu magic bullets. Take on the challenge of democracy, stay on the Rubicon, basically. <coughs> I'm trying to get to my last slide. Give, give me one minute, please, Jan. And because, just to say, and I will take this in Q&A, in the chapter with Max, we have a whole, uh, basically, a blueprint for how you can conceive of a monetary union which is democratic, which is decentered, dealing with markets, governments, and union level. And a lot of these ideas have been floated uh, earlier, but I can come back to it. And the politics of this is, of course, to give up democratic competition. My taxpayer is bigger than yours, very much so. My suffering is bigger than yours. And really engage in our democratic interdependence. And again, we'll come back to how you do this. And engage with issues that have to do with justice, empathy, uh, recognition, etc., but in a realist way not as if Europe was a nation state. So to conclude, because we're in Britain, because we're the Brexit debate matters enormously, and we've heard Simon and Tim and Chris Patton and others, and we all worry about it, I want to put forward an argument that perhaps the core should stop saying we'll save the periphery. It's the periphery that can save the core. It's the periphery that can tell the core, including France, including Germany, look guys, 
take democratic autonomy seriously. Take the idea that we have to really internalize the rules seriously and own them. Take the idea that we, shouldn't, we should stop telling the Eurosceptics it's you or us, us versus you, as if there was a kind of tyranny of the dichotomy in Europe, idealist, Eurosceptics. No, we need to create a space in the middle where we can have confrontation and conflict, agonistic politics, but develop also a common language of plural politics. And if we do that, I, I, would, I would really argue that we can just recover a kind of notion of sustainable integration, making Europe the guardian of the long term, because it's not very good at short-term democracy, and really teach citizens that the EU is about guaranteeing intergenerational justice, and the life of our grandchildren on this continent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As you notice, disciplining Greek colleagues is not easy, and we lost Simon Jenkins, who had to run to another commitment. So we, we will uh, have to ask what to do for Britain and Greece in this part. Uh, and of course, we have a British citizen here at the table too. Um, as you as you know, we are here to provide not only wisdom but also entertainment.